We've been, uh, uh, I know a lot of people, it's a meme, Tim Pool talking about mm-hmm. Civil War. But with the uh, the election coming up, I, I, wanted, I wanted to ask you specifically about this because you're Canadian. Mm-hmm. What's your perspective on what's happening here? Do you, like, so the, the escalation of violence, right? Yeah. So recently we've had a bunch of Trump rallies and then the left shows up and starts attacking the Trump supporters. And now you've got these stories popping up in mainstream news that right wing militias are coming and they're going to take over. And it's like, they're not even anywhere in sight. Like, yeah. who are these people? But, I, but I'm curious based on your perspective as a Canadian, what you think is going to happen? Well, I mean, the thing with American politics is that it's, it's kind of it's kind of like an STD. It spreads. <laughs> yes, go on. It spreads. What, okay. starts, like, what starts in American politics is going to infect the rest of the country. And I use the word infect very consciously. Look at things like critical race theory, right? Mm. That's everywhere. It started off in academia. And I think kind of like, well, I mean, there's argument to me to be made like the Frankfurt School German and stuff. But I think, you know, a lot of it has come from Americans. Yeah. And now it's all over the Western world. And I mean, we see the same thing with like, let's take Black Lives Matter. There are Black Lives Matter protests in Montreal. In Toronto, we've seen them in Europe, so it's, it's everywhere. Um, and you know, with these Antifa groups, they're getting bolder in the U.S. Again, we're seeing that in places like Montreal, like Toronto. Um, so you know, when we see this escalation happening in the United States, it's only a matter of time before it kind of spreads. Especially in Canada, we're so close um, and culturally, like very, very similar. Especially with social media, so. It's kind of scary to see um, because even in Canada, our last election cycle, Canadians are pretty apathetic about politics, you know, for for better or worse, you know, because it's nice. We don't really riot as much, but it's also concerning because there are a lot of problems that people don't talk about. Um, But yeah, this past election cycle was the first time it actually kind of felt almost like an American one. Like, you know, people were there like, well, the Hamilton event. I don't know if you saw with uh, Dave Rubin and Maxim Bernier. There were Antifa people. Oh, They attacked that old guy. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Well, That happened in Canada. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think, especially with the whole Barrett situation coming up, things are just going to get worse. There's going to be more and more tension, right? I mean, Tony Barrett. Yeah, with the Supreme Court pick, right? Um, Regardless of what happens, if they don't manage to get her through before the election, then the Democrats are going to be galvanized. And if they do manage to get her through, then uh, Democrats are going to think that uh, Handmaid's Tale. (laughs) I I, I read once that there was like a, a ruling from a high court in Canada that saying sorry was not an admission of guilt. I don't know if that's true or just I'm a meme. I'm not sure. I haven't heard. I, have, I wouldn't be surprised, though. Right. Because yeah. that's like the, the meme about Canada. It's yeah. Like, you know, so, but actually, Canada, sorry. it's it's kind of disappointing because, I mean, on the surface level, we're pretty free. And don't get me wrong. I would if you're a Canadian, you're still very, very lucky. But the thing you have to understand about Canada is that right to self-defense, not a thing. Right to bear arms, not mm-hmm. a thing. Even you know, right to freedom of speech, not really a thing. We have this thing called the Canadian like Charter of Rights and Freedoms, but every essential right and freedom kind of has a little asterisk next to it saying, subject to the whims of the government. Right. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. So, it's part of the British Commonwealth. Yeah. And a, a lot of the law is kind of based on like... Uh, is it... Is it so, still though? I thought it, I thought it, they left. Well, no. Left. Our our head of state is still technically the queen. She's still on all, wow. all of our money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's weird. And she she appoints someone to to run. You guys vote for Trudeau, right? Yeah, or well, you we vote have for whoever. We have the parliamentary system, which I think is inferior because the the administrative head is is also the legislative head, and you don't actually vote for a prime minister. You vote for the party. And whoever gets whatever party gets the most votes, the head of that party becomes the prime minister. So, for example, if I'm an American, I can completely and I'm I'm able to in my own local district vote for, let's say, a Democrat. But then for president, I want Trump and I want them to be able to have that check and balance system between the the parties. You can't do that in Canada. Oh, wow. Yeah. Does the and now you're stuck with Trudeau. I feel bad for you guys. Prime Minister Blackface, but he's yes. dreamy. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's dreamy. Pretty. And actually, we were we were talking about all of the economic hardships that Corona is causing. He recently pledged to donate 400 million Canadian dollars to fight COVID abroad. Oh, but that's like 10 bucks. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> but yeah, this this happening as so many Canadians are, and so many Canadian businesses are facing bankruptcies, and you know we're having a lot of economic problems. But it's okay because he's taking care of. The world. Is, is this, he yeah. like? Is his hand held by the queen? How does that work? How much autonomy does he have? Oh, he has total autonomy. I mean, it's it's largely ceremonial. I mean, don't get me wrong. If I were somehow crowned monarch of England, I would like reform the Commonwealth. I would get things going again. Oh, does but... she she control the military? She controls the military of Australia. I'm pretty sure. I'm not sure about Australia, I but know. I know for Canada, it's it's largely ceremonial. I mean, like on the books, she is technically, but it's it's yeah, not something like, that's people wouldn't go for it. Yeah. I, was, I was talking to some British people, too, and I asked them, like, what would happen if the queen actually intervened in affairs? And they were like, people would probably snap mm-hmm. and flip out. Like, 
it's 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 a she's a, you know she's the head of state. She does have the power, but she never uses it. It's largely viewed as like never going to happen. Yeah, right. so this yeah. Is, she's essentially like a figurehead in a tourist attraction at you know, this point. You know the yeah. You know what the problem is with all of our leaders. No, well not Trump, not Trump. Um, Trudeau and the Democrats, they're not leaders. They don't want to take responsibility for anything that happens. So they're playing it perfectly. If the businesses get wiped out, they can say, oh, but but COVID, mm -hmm. you know, we had a lockdown. If they release the lockdown and someone dies, they'll get blamed. So the, that's the best thing they can do is just say, well, we had to lock down as a pandemic. And then as everyone's lives are destroyed and businesses are wiped out, they can say, oh, don't look at me. It was COVID. Yeah. Yeah. But then if people die, they'll say, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? So they're basically use the heaviest hand possible to absolve myself of any and all leadership and responsibility. And then you get someone like Trump, who, of course, is far from perfect, but he's saying, like, we got to keep the economy going. Mm -hmm. And you had all of these, these, these stories coming out. You had the UN, I guess, saying a study, 250 million people could die from starvation because the economy grinding to a halt. And this is why doctors should not choose how to, like, doctors don't run countries. Yes. So, like, you, you have Fauci saying all these great things, you know, early on. Donald Trump's doing a great job. Okay, that's wonderful. Then later on, he's like, well, here's what we should have done. There are reasons why we elect people to represent us to make decisions, and we don't just have appointed doctors, because mm -hmm. the doctor doesn't understand how banking works. Doctor doesn't understand how business in New York works. Right. The doctor's going to be like, this virus will kill these people. We got to shut down to stop these people from dying. Then the economist is going to say, mm, that's interesting. We're going to lose twice as many people if the economy shuts down, right. because starvation, homelessness, sickness, depression, depression yeah. suicide. Addiction. Oh, yeah, all that stuff. And it's all just... The, 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 the only thing we end up hearing is, and I love this part, where they're like, you must listen to the science and listen to the doctors. It's like, okay, all right. Then Trump's doctors comes out, come out and they're like, he's okay to leave. Everything's great. And they're like, no, <laughs> he's sick. He's going to kill people. <laughs> There's actually somebody tweeted, you know, Trump is going to kill people by leaving. And I'm like, you know what, man? There is a tweet for every circumstance about Trump and whatever. And it's like, they, they have done everything in their power to make sure he cannot actually do anything. But they're not doing anything. So you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of like a dad, like, you know, walking to the backyard to like, I don't know, fire up the grill and the kids are holding on his legs, screaming. <laughs> and he's like, trying to walk and the kids <laughs> won't let go. Urgh, and you're really annoying. That's basically what's going on, in my opinion. Um, who do you think are some great leaders in the world? Man, I don't know. That's a tough one. If you had to pick three. Like define leader, I guess. Well, you define it. Oh, man. Good leaders. Not followers. I don't know. What do you think? You're the guest. Well, you, I mean, you, you I have, the there, there are certain politicians that I like, but un, like, unfortunately for me, they don't always tend to win. So I don't oh. know. If, I don't know if you can call them leaders. Rand Paul. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely Rand Paul. Rand Paul. I like yeah. uh, Maxim Bernier, who's Canadian. Mm -hmm. He he tried to start up the uh, the only actual like libertarian kind of center right party in Canada because the conservatives in Canada are like, I mean, they're essentially Socialists. democrats yeah i mean because it's still <laughs> it's still canada um him i like let's see a third one let's see anyone in europe that's cool uh, victor I, yeah victor orban yeah. he's he's kind of authoritarian though but i i i like a lot of lot of what he does like i don't know enough about him to say i support him because you know there i'm sure there's probably things that i don't condone but i mean overall i think you know when it comes to things like immigration they've at least been listening to their their people which is something that a lot of people i think in canada and the u.s don't feel like is happening i guess i guess the question is like what like a good leader is an opinion right yeah. there's, there's reasons to say why the, the the democrats that are obstructing trump in a million ways you could argue is a good thing. Mm -hmm. I personally don't think so, but I'm sure they could come up with something like, oh, but, you know, putting a check on executive authority is important no matter what. And I'm kind of like, yeah, but, uh, you know, jamming a wrench in the spokes for the sake of damaging the spokes isn't, yeah. you know, real leadership. But I'm sure someone could, could argue something like that. You could argue that Vladimir Putin is very strong and he makes Russia strong. Yeah, he's efficient. Mm -hmm. Right. He's an efficient yeah. leader. Yeah. Xi Jinping. Yeah, yeah. also efficient. <laughs> hey, hey, look, look. <laughs> China is 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 dominating. Yeah. And so, sure, they've got concentration camps. The, the, the question is, like, what constitutes a good leader? From an American perspective, it's very, very different from what other people in the world would say for sure. I, I mm -hmm. think so. I don't think those people are good leaders, by the way. I think into, like, the private sector, like Elon Musk strikes Definitely. me as a leader. Jeff Definitely. Bezos mm -hmm. is, a, is a leader. I, people, a lot of them might get down on me for, for saying that about Jeff. But, I mean, he's got blue. What's that blue? What's his space program called? You know, I've, I've been spending a lot of time on Facebook, and I just really like Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg is the greatest. Is the greatest leader. <laughs> Susan, the greatest we'll leader. Great. We must find, all vote Zuckerberg. Do you find great leaders in the private sector? Do you think they gravitate towards politics or 
or maybe because I don't know. Sometimes I think leaders can lead from behind. Sometimes they oh, they can absolutely be in the private sector, and oh. I think a lot of a lot of them are in the Most private sector. You yeah. know who's a bad leader? Jay Inslee. Oh gosh, is he? yes. Oh yeah, you know who he is? No, he's governor of uh, Washington, and Boeing just announced they're leaving. So there's a, there's a lot of reasons. Yeah. They're, they're losing a ton of money because no one's flying anymore. So that means they're in trouble. They make planes. I mean, they make other things too. But yeah, you know, they planes. do. Uh, uh, so anyway, they're going to consolidate their production, I think, in South Carolina. And so now they're losing all these jobs in Washington. But I do think it has a lot to do with COVID restrictions. Mm-hmm. Probably has a lot to do with the, the rioting. But we also saw the same thing with Elon Musk. He's moving, I guess he's moving to Texas. Is that what yeah. mm-hmm. So... Man, I, I'm seeing all this stuff go down. I remember when Elon was like, I'm leaving because the state is insane. And they were basically harassing him, even though the state said, here's what you got to do to open. And he was like, we're good. The local county was like, no, no yeah. we're not going to let you, Elon. So he leaves. And you just reminds me of Atlas Shrugged. Mm-hmm. All the all the heads of yep. industry are like, we're out. Well, you can this, have your regulation. There's this huge exodus out of California, right? I mean, Joe Rogan's leaving. Elon Musk is leaving. Daily Wire folks. I mean, yeah, I just, Blair White. Blair White. Yeah, yeah, I feel like there's so many people who are just like, all right, I'm out. And I don't. I mean, I don't blame them. And it's it's sad because there are parts of California that are really beautiful. There are a lot of wonderful people. Like there are good things about California. It's it's a very successful state in a lot of different metrics. They attract talent. But man, do they love killing business there. They just, yeah. they love it. I left in 2018 and I went back a few months ago and I have no at all yeah. desire to go back there. It was like so stuffy. And I mean, it's this beautiful, wide open Los Angeles, particularly wide open space with homeless people everywhere. Great typhus, smelling air, but yeah. this time it was like you had to wear a mask and everybody was like. I don't know. Well, gross, but, 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 the, but the mask waiting is waiting in lines to get to the grocery but even store. I, the disgusting. mask is because of the typhoid outbreak, not because <laughs> yeah, of yeah, yeah. Not a coronavirus. Yeah, but, but I went to, I did my freshman year at USC. And, uh, you know, I grew up in Southeast Asia, but LA was the only time in my life that I remember feeling genuinely unsafe for my, like, just my personhood my property i had i'd never experienced anything it's like it it's a horrible place it is yeah it's yeah. A, it, it's a wretched hive of scum and I villainy i used to Indeed. love it love it in like 2005 and 6 you know weed was legal for the first time in, in my life and it was like wow this is like the liberal this is where we can change the country we can start here and it felt like that and the entertainment industry was mm-hmm. killing it all these youtubers were flocking to los angeles the beach 72 degrees every day it was yeah. like and now they're repealing civil rights law. Yeah, and feces in the streets. Wow. Yeah. yeah, dirty needles. Oh man, yeah. And the funny thing is about the the poop patrol in San Francisco is that there's, it's actually a problem in other cities too, but they're just the worst. Mm-hmm. What I love about San Francisco is that there's someone made a map of all of the instances of, of human poop in the streets, and when you look at it, there's so many. It's just a giant brown splotch <laughs> over the map. You can't even see the city. Yeah, because yeah, there's so many. They actually had to hire a poop patrol. Like it's yeah. like, could, could you imagine? It's like. Your town is going over their expenses. Like, well, the fire department costs us this much per, per year. We have EMS and police. And, ah, yes, the poop department. Like, that's crazy. Is it taxpayer funded? Yeah, it's public. Yeah. It's a public program. It's like it's like they, they come out with, and spray the poop down. Ugh. That's that's nuts. Like, are there other departments we don't know about that just don't, re, re, like, register with us? Like, we all know the fire department. We all know the, we all know the police department. Mm-hmm. But are, is there, like... Other government programs because the poop department seems like that's a new one. Yeah, it's, it's new, yeah for sure. You know, Unique. and 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 uh, well, uh, hopefully not the rest of our future. Yeah, well, actually, know? we did a video about San Francisco. Um, we called it San Francisco. <laughs> um, but yeah, they have there they have a lot of infrastructure dedicated to the homeless. I think they spend like it, an actual person's yearly income per year on each homeless person. But guess what? They're still homeless, um, and. It's it's crazy because it's, and it's actually I, I know a lot of conservatives like like to laugh at San Francisco because they feel like this vindication that ah, all of your, your far left policies are bad. But it is sad. I remember I when I was, I think, 18 or 19, I visited San Francisco and I thought it was beautiful. And it's like if you're from there and you see what your city has become, like if you're a business owner out there and now you have like someone shooting up in front of your business every day, feasting on the street, they're like videos online that have gone viral of like women being attacked by random crazy homeless people like that's man i, I don't think and there's, there's a stu- and, and, at the, and and all the while there's a starbucks literally across the street from the starbucks like no joke yeah, yeah there, the and there's focus. like I, I remember i was at a starbucks and this is like i forgot what this was like it's near market street or something and i'm walking out and i look I was up, as i'm walking out i'm like there's a starbucks across the street there's a line i was like but i just walked out of a starbucks <laughs> with no line 
Why would anybody? Well, this is the weirdest. Yeah, I know. No, no kidding. That the, Starbucks is the good Starbucks. Yeah, 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 right. It's San Francisco in 2014 ish. I lived there for like a year, and it was really cool to get offered like, "Hey, do you want to buy mushrooms as you're walking down the street?" Oh, like, oh, <laughs> the first time, but yeah. like the 19th time, it's just. And then the guy's like trying to step pa- step over people and pass yeah. people, and you're like, "No, man." Now you got like whole it's markets the where guy. they're like no, hold, still, just hold, holding up in their jacket. They and really just, will. Like, They'll crazy. try and sell you mu- like right up. They'll just walk up to you and be like, "Want to buy some mushrooms?" I don't know if they do it to everybody. San Francisco <laughs> is you just have that <laughs> my long hair. Yeah. It's, 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 it's capital. It's capital city from the Hunger Games, right? Yeah, San Francisco. So, yeah, so you have these big wealthy industries. You have these these tech companies that are in not necessarily San Francisco, but the Bay Area. Super wealthy, powerful, big tech in Silicon Valley. And then you have like it's 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 like it, it, it's the scariest thing about it is it reminds me kind of uh, of Ukraine where you have oligarchs who control everything lo- like you know and then you have all r- extreme poverty. So think about uh, another city that would be like San Francisco and it's it's hard to find where you have some of the wealthiest people on the planet billionaires mm-hmm. running their empires mostly San Francisco. And at the same time you have poor people taking dumps in the street and doing drugs. Right. And there's rampant homelessness. I think India has a lot of cities. Not maybe not a lot, but Delhi, I think, is like that. No, yeah. for sure, for sure. I mean, in the U.S., in the US this I, is like I can't think of one. It's it's it reminds me of Ukraine, where a small handful of oligarchs control everything, and because they're so wealthy, they basically set the prices, and mm-hmm. they'll never lose their power. And that's kind of what we get with big tech, where they control what we can see, hear, and even say. Then you have all these really you know poor people, so they're clearly not interested in helping you know anybody. It's well, actually, I, I think they they think they're interested in helping people, and that's why they push far left policies. And I really do think that a lot of the the people from San Francisco, even somewhere like LA, that has a huge you know wealth inequality issue. I think they think the rest of the country is like that. Like in their yeah. cities, you you have the millionaires, the billionaires, and the homeless people. And I think they think a that's common, and b it's also capitalism's fault. So that's why in these hubs, these liberal hubs, you have like, I mean, literal socialists who want to tear down the system. So this, this, we were talking a little, a little bit about this before the show started, but uh, I, I wanted to ask you, because I, I was sort of asking you earlier, but we'll just go back into it. From a Canadian perspective, what do you think is going to happen in the U.S. on election night? I mean, I don't like usually to make predictions because I'm always worried about being put into one of those like reels of people being wrong and then owned. So I tried I try to avoid making any like any predictions, but I I do think Trump will win. I mean, I definitely think he was on course to win in a landslide before the whole COVID thing. Um, you know, then things kind of became a little bit unclear, but right now I think a lot of people are tired of the restrictions and a lot of people are worried about the economy and I think Trump has a proven track record on that. And I know a lot of you know, Democrats are trying to say that this torpedoed economy is Trump's fault, but people remember, right? They remember, like, filing their taxes from last year. They remember how, how well things were going, and I think they trust that a lot more than Biden. But the polls have, you know, in some states, Biden's up, like, nearly double digits. Yeah, I mean, I remember what the polls said last time as well. And it, it's hard because I don't want to be one of those people who just dismisses polls because they don't like what I what I think and i I want to just have confirmation bias but i think there there is a proven issue with trying to pull trump supporters and his base i think we saw that last year and i know the last election cycle two years ago you know things didn't go well for the republicans in terms of the house but trump wasn't on the ticket then right he is he is now and there are a lot of people who probably didn't vote in the primaries because trump wasn't there they're maybe not necessarily republicans uh maybe not necessarily even politically active but now that trump is on the ticket this time i think it's going to make a difference so so the polls in 2016 were off by a couple points, maybe like a point or two. Mm-hmm. And so what ended up happening is you had all these forecasters like, oh, if Michigan's going Hillary, then Trump's going to win. Mm-hmm. Trump ended up winning uh, from uh, due to 77,000 votes across several swing states. Like in some states, it was thin margins mm-hmm. where he got winner take all electoral votes. So he did really well in the electoral college. The weird thing now is like, uh, we, we we had uh, Jack Murphy on the podcast recently, and he asked me, he's like, do you think the conditions that led to Donald Trump are worse, or do you think things have gotten better? I'm like, oh, it's way worse. And he's like, so then why would Trump lose? Right. And I'm like, but the polls, right? The polls were wrong. But come on, like Biden's up by like 10 points in some of these polls, like 14, 27 among seniors, like some ridiculous numbers, unless they're literally lying and the polls are like broken beyond repair. Mm-hmm. I mean- can, can, is that is that is that a strong possibility? This is, the, this is what I was thinking. Like, maybe what happened in 2016 was the polls were slightly off, not because they they couldn't find Trump's base and they fix and and they went out to fix it. Maybe their attempts to fix it resulted in them going the other direction. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I feel like that's wishful thinking. I, 
Oh, what were you going to say? Well, I was just going to say that, I mean, polling is a really, really hard thing to do accurately. I mean, any type of social science quantification is going to be difficult, right? I mean, because basically what you're doing with these polls is you have small groups and you're hoping that you're, you're going to be as representative as possible. But there's no way to do that without any type of bias at all. So I think, you know, when we look at polls, you you've, they, they have a margin of error for a reason. And I think they're usually pretty... I mean, they're pretty optimistic with the margins of error that they give. So that's the first thing. And also the second thing is I see a lot of national polls and people always love to talk about the national polls. The, the American president is not chosen by direct democracy, right? right? Yep. So it's a lot more useful to do what you do and talk about these specific states that might be swing states and how they're performing in those areas. But when I see stuff about like overall, you know, Biden is up nationally, it's like, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if yeah. everybody in California loves Biden and hates Trump. Like he was never going to get those votes anyway. There's a, a, a poll from Democracy Institute and I think the Sunday Express in the UK that has Trump actually up nationally, mm-hmm. has Biden at 45, Trump at 46. And, I, and that, that's why I asked you, you know, I say like, you're Canadian. Yeah. And it's because I wonder if the reason, the difference between these polls in the U.S. versus, you know, the Sunday Express is like, you've got a U.K. company. They don't know or care for the most part about our biases. I'm sure they do a little bit, but they're probably like from the outside looking in, here's what we see. Mm-hmm. And then you have all these companies and, and universities, whatever, in the U.S. And they're in the bubble. They're in the fray. They can't see outside yeah. of it. Well, I mean, some insight I want to do, I do want to give as a Canadian is that you guys are absolutely insane when it comes to election security. Like you, you don't have any. Yep. Like you don't. And it's. it's do you have voter ID in Canada? Of course. <laughs> Why not? Of course. I cannot, for the life of me, think of a country that doesn't aside from America and uh, how it's controversial in America. I have no idea. It's racist. Like, of course, we have voter ID law. Oh my! Like I have you ever have you ever seen that video with Ami Horowitz where he goes and asks? Yeah. So so for those that aren't familiar, this this uh, this this guy Ami Horowitz goes to a bunch of Berkeley students and says, "Is voter ID racist?" They all say yes. He asks them why, and they're like, oh, because, you know, people in these minority communities can't find the DMV, or they can't afford it, or they don't have license, they don't have a license, or they don't have internet. So then he literally goes to Harlem and talks to a bunch of black people, and my, and then they're all just basically like, what? Like, like I have course. ID. Yeah, of course yeah. we have the internet. Of course we have IDs. But my favorite interaction was where he's talking to this, like, middle-aged black dude, and he goes, do you know where the DMV at? The, or, do you know where the DMV is at? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, it's right over there on 25th Street. Like, as if he was giving him directions. Like, of course he yeah. knows where the DMV <laughs> why is. He? How insanely racist are these people? No, it's the bigotry of low expectations, for sure. I think they're overt white supremacists. Yeah. With guilty consciences. I mean, they if you listen to the stuff, the, the things that they say, they essentially want to treat black people like pets or mentally challenged children who can't take care of themselves and, you know, aren't able to self to self-determine, you know, their futures, which is really, really depressing. Thanks for checking out this clip from the TimCast IRL podcast. We do the show live Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. So come back to check us out when we go live. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, hit the notification bell. And we are also available on all podcast platforms for free. If you want to listen to us there, thanks for hanging out and we will see you all next time.